Popper, I hate, I mean, I don't use that word lightly, but I'm using it. I hate to admit how much I miss you and that ugly mug. I miss it. I wish I could say the same. <laughs> Why am I, I really not surprised do. by this? <laughs> <laughs> I kid. Uh, hey, I would give anything right now to be on a bus all, all the way up to Sudbury and Sault Ste. Marie. Wouldn't that be a treat? It, 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 uh, it sucks strange. sitting at home. Yeah, it's so weird, isn't it? Like, we're supposed to be in the rhythm. And, and for me, that rhythm started on Labor Day weekend when there wasn't a preseason showcase or a fan barbecue in Kitchener. And honest to goodness, you can ask anybody in my family that I'm completely out of sorts on my weekends without hockey games to do. It's weird. It's nice having a Saturday night and a Friday night. I will say that. But now that we can't do anything with it, I, I'd much rather be at a rink. Yeah, maybe that's part of it. It was a novelty, certainly, in the early days, but it's kind of wearing thin. We both uh, became pand pandemic puppy parents, though. That's kind of cool. Yeah, you got a second one, eh? <laughs> Just a glutton for punishment. Dumb. What are you thinking? Dumb. Dumb. How's Gus the Golden? Oh, as we sit here recording this, I'm staring over at him in my basement office, and he's currently chewing a coat hanger, throwing it up in the air and catching it. So <laughs> that's where we're at. I've pulled about there's six socks on my desk if I'm being perfectly honest um, because he has an affirmation for chewing socks and uh, Goldens will eat anything so my life is essentially just chasing after a dog and pulling things out of his mouth it's great I love it what a yes. time so in in the midst of all of this in October uh, Ranger the boxer that we've had now just turned four and uh, about a month later we brought Rosie the boxer husky mix into the family. And I had forgotten how difficult it was with a puppy. She is just over three months old and it is mayhem. It's mayhem. Yeah. I, I, <laughs> everyone always asks how it is. And I said, well, you know, when he first came around, it was like probably 50% of the time I loved him. 50% of the time I was researching where the pound was. And then it went from about 70 to 30. And now we're at about 90, 10. So I it continues to improve. He's six months and I'm sure it'll only be uh, better as it goes on. But those puppy days, holy jumping. I, I don't know how I could do it if I was on the road. Tell me about it. So by the time we get back to doing what we're supposed to be doing, we'll have great dog stories to share about how awesome dogs are but right now maybe not so much these really are the dog days of the season well done uh -huh. well done and i used the word stories not deliberately but it makes me think of this and that's what this is sort of all about i don't think we're the only ones that miss the rhythm and the routine that comes with an ohl season whatever market the ohl fans are in any of the 20 they're missing those games and we thought that maybe we could help bridge the gap to fill that void until we get back to playing games and uh, talk to some people that have some stories to share about their time in the Ontario Hockey League or currently their time in the Ontario Hockey League. Yeah, basically right now we're normally forecasting what the World Junior Team is going to look like and getting ready for that Christmas break and start, we even start talking trade deadline because it's inching closer as the uh, December calendar flips here um, and I think it's more so you and I just like to be busy and we thought we're not as busy as we normally are and we have too much time on our hands and our significant others are getting sick of us. So they said, Hey, why don't you call each other and spend some time together? So you can take some of the brunt of the anger from both of us instead of our significant others. I, I like to think that there is an appetite that needs to be filled and hopefully with what you're going to be listening to and watching technology has allowed us the opportunity now to do several of these podcasts on Zoom. So if you're a real glutton for punishment and these two mugs, uh, boy, oh boy, is that going to be fun for you? It's going to be great. Hey, that's, that's why I got into broadcasting in the first place was telling stories. And uh, I love being able to get stories from other people. So this uh, interviewing people for the podcast and feeding some of that appetite for OHL fans and getting to know some of the things we don't know that have happened around is just great. I've always loved the stories that you had to share about your time trying to, trying to make that big step into the Ontario Hockey League. So we'll hear more of those 
And what do I got? Stories about bad media room coffee. That's about all I can bring to the table. Hey, you were in the iron lung with Don Cameron for over a handful of years. We can just get you to echo some of his stories because Lord knows there was plenty told on the way up to Sue. Oh man. Yeah. Miss him dearly, but hopefully this will help fill a void and uh, get you some of the stories that uh, have happened that continue to happen in the game that we all love. So welcome to the debut of OHL stories with Farwell and Pope. A first round draft pick into the Ontario hockey league, a third rounder into the national hockey league to the Montreal Canadians, no less. And today an addictions counselor, which is, rather poetic. Graham Bonner joins us for this episode. It is an honor, Mr. Bonner. Thanks for making the time for us. <laughs> well, it's my honor, Mike. So thank you for having me on your show, especially, um, you know, being a Sioux Greyhound, Kitchener Rangers, it's only fitting with the rivalry we had, but the love and respect of the players in that, that it's, uh, uh, thanks for reaching out. Well, you know, it's, it's funny. There are so many things for us to talk about, and your story in and of itself is an important one for people to hear. But when you and I were just chatting, Graham, to kind of set this up, you, you got into a little bit of a story about a pregame warm-up bench-clearing brawl. And I'm like, well, how can we not start there? Like the era of hockey in the mid-1980s when you were in the Ontario Hockey League, that sort of thing was almost routine, wasn't it? Well, I mean, when you tell people about it now who weren't in that era, they look at you like you're telling fish stories or whatever it may be. Um, we had that, well, that, there was the two years there that Kitchener and the Sioux had big, well, the Kitchener and the Sioux had rivalries forever. But in both those seasons, I can count, you know, eight or nine brawls. I mean, a couple in warm up. I mean, there was the big one we had in Hamilton in the OHL game of the week that all you have to do is use to that. And that's anywhere between 12 and 30 minutes, depending on who downloaded it. But the one that we're referring to, we're playing Kitchener um, in the old Sioux Memorial Gardens. <clears throat> and Carmen Vanny and Chris Brandt fought right at center ice. There was no linesman, no referee. The Back in these days, the referees were probably just shoveling snow trying to get into the rink in the Sioux. <laughs> But it was, uh, yeah, it, it was a, a, a full-out brawl in warm-up. Everyone settled the score, went back to the dressing rooms, and then we just went out and dropped the puck and started the game. But I think that was the starting of the linesman coming on the ice for, for warm-up. I mean, we're talking anywhere between, you know, I started in the league in 82. Um, I played four years, so 86-ish. But, um, yeah. Um, the game certainly changed. I, I think it should have been cleaned up a little bit, but I think it's gone way too much in a different direction now. But um, uh, I'm not making money to, to make these decisions. But <laughs> <laughs> you, mentioned, you mentioned that other memorable brawl uh, on the OHL Game of the Week in Hamilton, Bill LaForge's Steelhawks, Terry Crisp, your coaches, Sue Greyhounds. And this thing was, I mean, it was, it was, utterly wild but I'm looking at at some of the guys that you would have played with in the Sioux you've got Bob Probert you've got Jeff Bukaboom you had Rick Tockett in your first year there but I mean what what kind of message was that sending at the time about the kind of league this was again you're going to be on the game of the week and this is what's happening <laughs> you know as part of it well I, I I don't know Hamilton Hamilton had a tough well there, you got to remember there's some tough teams I mean it wasn't just uh, we had a tough team. I mean, we also had Brett Peer. We also had Chris Brandt. Never mind Probert, Bukaboom. Um, and excuse me if I'm forgetting some of the other guys, but but everybody could play back then. It wasn't, um, you know, sometimes people look at themselves as just being, you know, one-dimensional fourth-line player. I mean, Bob Probert was was an NHL all-star. Jeff Bukaboom won Stanley Cups. Brett Peer was a, was a great player. Chris Brandt. And that goes – with a lot of the players that um, that we played with. Now, it, it, it was a different game. So I don't know. It's hard to compare the two, just knowing that that's the way it was then and this is the way it is now. I don't even know if I answered your question, Mike, but I did it to the <laughs> best that, that, that I could, right? But um, I appreciated the game a lot more back then i'm not saying that we should go back to slap shot however i think we've swung too far in one direction 
and sometimes the pendulum comes back, but like I said, um, I don't know. Well, also in that era, outside, because this is, this is an era that I think many of us remember fondly, Graham. This was where I was cutting my teeth, certainly in the Ontario Hockey League in my uh, early to mid-teens in the mid-1980s, watching these teams play when they swung through Kitchener as a Kitchener kid. I got to see everybody come through the odd. And, and you kind of looked forward to that stuff once in a while, to be honest with you. It was part of the game. You, you almost came to expect it. But one of the other things that, that happened in your time in Sault Ste. Marie is something that is yet to be equaled, and that was the undefeated home record of 33-0. and 0. Was there a point in time during the season where it became like it started setting into your head that boy, we could run the table here on home ice. You start thinking about it. I think once we started getting up, um, there was a few that there was, um, I believe there was an OHL record um, at 27. And, I, and then when it got, I mean, we, once we got into the twenties, one thing about the Sioux, the Sioux is a tough building to play in, just the way the odd is, is in Kitchener. I mean, the odd's one of my favorite buildings of all time to, to play in. Um, but the fans can be very tough. Um, the Sioux is a tough place to come into on a Sunday night or a Friday night. You know, the steel mill's blown out steam. You're under 10 feet of snow, and, and it's, it's a steel town. Um, and there used to be the called the infamous Sioux flu, where guys would get their mysterious groin injuries and warm up, and uh, you wouldn't see them skating during the game so especially I think it goes back to Muzz McPherson even when he was coaching Wayne Gretzky in the early 70s the Sioux had tough teams but Terry Chris brought in um, you know the Philadelphia Flyers hockey but with talent he believed in hanging your jerseys together um, being strong not losing at home um, but we really believed once we started getting up there, the, we did start to feel the pressure, Mike, like, like it, it, it was because, um, I mean, we didn't lose too often at home, even the season before uh, that I was there. But, um, you know, back then, social media wasn't as big as it was, but we were getting some, some hype from Hockey Night in Canada and, and different things. So, um, but every team that came in there, you know, the London Knights, the Hamilton Steelhawks, the Kitchener Rangers, the Peterborough Peets, who are the number one team in the other division. Um, it, it's like being, um, you know, a heavyweight champion. Someone's coming in there trying to knock you off your feet. So there were some really good games at the end. I mean, we weren't blowing everybody out. There were some tough games. I mean, and, and the last game against London went into overtime. So you great were... memories. <laughs> great memories. Uh, uh, no doubt. Uh... I mentioned at the outset of this, a first rounder into the O, but not with the Sioux. You were drafted by Windsor, then traded up to the Sioux. What goes through a Southern Ontario boy's mind? I mean, you're from Mimico, then you're in Windsor for the OHL. All of a sudden, you're being traded to the most Northern outpost we've got in the league. What goes through your mind when you think of, oh my gosh, I'm going to Sioux St. Marie? Well, originally, Mike, there, there was mixed emotions. For me, Windsor is a great hockey town and has, holds a very special place in my heart. However, at that particular time, they were, they were struggling a little bit. Um, I was a first rounder that didn't really produce. I needed to change the scenery, honestly, to tell you the truth. So going to the Sioux, I knew I was going to a winning team. Um, I had respect for Terry Chris, Sam McMaster, and some of the guys that had already been there. You know, you mentioned the Rick Tockets, the Steve Grays, Chris Felix. They, they had a foundation of winning teams. So I looked at it as a new chance. Um, to rejuvenate my career. Um, sure, you have little trepidations. You're being traded somewhere else. You know, you're a 16 year old kid being moved again. All those things come in. But when I got there, man, it was like, there's not a better place to play hockey. I may be a little bit biased with that, but uh, I'll hold up my end of the argument. <laughs> 66 tucks in your 19 year old season. That is. Uh not a number that a lot of players can say they reach. How? Like, was it just one of those things where they say every time the puck was on your stick, it felt like it was going to go into the back of the net? Well, I, I was a natural goal scorer. The year before I was rated in the first round and I dropped down in the NHL draft because I didn't score goals. Um, so I, the Sioux gave me that opportunity to build some confidence back. 
Um, and, and I owe that to Terry Crisp and, and all the players that I played with. What, what the Sioux enabled me to do is get my game back. Um, I played with some great players. I mean, nobody can do that on their own. I mean, there was, uh, you know, I played with Wayne Gruel and Bob Probert, Mike Oliverio and Derek King, um, and Wayne Presley and Chris Brandt. Um, and the list just goes on and on. I mean, you can't do that on your own. I had a very, very supportive, high talented cast of great, not just great players, but great people. Do you still keep in touch with any of them? Well, it's funny we were talking about that just before we got on, Mike. It's um, hockey's a funny thing. You may not talk to somebody for ten years, five years, twenty years, but once you start talking, especially hockey guys or sports guys in general, it's just like we were sitting in the dressing room together. Um, last year was the thirty-fifth anniversary of our of our OHL championship and the thirty-three and O team. And there's a super fan up in the Sioux called Chris Sky, and he started posting these games um from that year on facebook so you know one person jumps in another person has jumped in so it was it was a friendly get together a sioux alumni um a bunch of guys just that haven't seen each other in a long time and some really nice memories and things and even players from different teams i know uh you know garnet mckechnie who's a player who i, I really uh respect i mean he'd get on there and we throw some jabs back and forth um but uh you know to reminisce about that it, it was a special feeling sometimes we forget junior hockey was some of the best memories that, for most of us that we had in our entire lives and some of us went on and had um nhl careers but whether we played in europe some of us ended up doing different things but we developed into good people and to find out that we're doing well today is, is very, very special. You touched on a moment ago the NHL and your projection of a first rounder, but you weren't scoring enough and then you get your yeah. sixth, six. But either way, you end up going third round to the Montreal Canadiens, 54th overall. That is absolutely nothing to sneeze at. When you hear your name called by the Montreal Canadiens organization, what's going through a young man's mind? Well, First of all, it was at the Montreal Forum, um, and you know the forum's no longer around. But I mean, it is a museum. I mean, it, it, there, there's hockey gods there. Um, it's a really, really nervous day to be honest with you, Mike, because I was supposed to go ninth overall, seventeenth overall. Then you get in the second or third round, then you're starting to think, "What the heck's going on here?" You know. But then when your name's announced, the first thing you think of is. Guy Lafleur, <laughs> Bob Ganey, Serge Savard, Larry Robinson, because they were just they just came off winning a whole lot of the Stanley Cups. Um, so you're excited, nervous, all different feelings. It's it's a lot for an 18 year old to go through, but you're also seeing all your friends, the guys you played with, all around you celebrating. So it's 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 a day you remember, but it's one of the most nervous days of your life at the same time. How do the nerves on that day, Graham, compare to the nerves on the first day you walk in for a training camp with them? Um, th there's some similarities. You know, I mean, the thing is with Montreal, the first year you go there, um, especially back, and that was just the end of their heyday, as, a, as an 18-year-old, you know you're not sticking around very long. And you get a number 50 and up because all the numbers in Montreal are retired, you know. Um, you're there for the experience, you know. I mean, I got to go to a training camp with Guy Lafleur's last year, so um, that was pretty cool. Walk, walking for a bunch of rookies to see. I, w I wasn't a Habs fan growing up, but we're sitting at in the arena or at the forum, and, and it was just like a gush of air comes blowing through the far end of the winding, and there's a balding guy with hair blowing out like this, and it was the flower. They said, now we know why we call them the flower. I mean, my hairs of my arms are standing up even talking about it. And you see all these hockey gods walking into training camp. Like any, any day, you know, John Beliveau's there. Uh, uh, not Rocket Richard, but the pocket rocket walks into the dressing room. I mean, hockey royalty on any particular day in training camp, and they're all dressed in suits. It's like the, the, uh, the Montreal Canadiens mafia walking in. Um, but class, I think that, that that was the biggest the biggest thing that that uh, 
that I felt was I was I was amongst class. You talk about going to those camps and when you're that rookie, the, the numbers start at 50 and up, you know you're not going to be around for long. But isn't it at one of those camps, did you not get your number, 29? Yeah, my second year. Yeah, yeah, yeah. yeah, my, yeah my second year, I, I went in there. Um, and that year, I thought I had a shot um, as, as a 19-year-old. And there was the big changing of the guards. And Montreal was switching from that run-and-gun hockey. The Oilers actually took off with that. But they couldn't score. And I just came off the big year. I was supposed to come in and start at right wing and be the next goal scorer. And um, and you walk in and number 29 is there. And, you know, Ken Dryden, I think, was the last regular player to wear that. So you're thinking you're, you know, things are all make go or at least have a good shot at it. Right. So was that following the blueprint almost to a T for you, Graham, from I mean, we know how hockey mad this country is, and so many of us grow up thinking that you know we. How many of us have hoisted the Stanley Cup in the backyard over, over our lifetime as kids playing? So at that point, when when you look back, was that? I mean, you're thinking you're going to slot in there as the right winger. This is going to be your year. You you've achieved this by the age of 20 in your hockey career. Was that following the blueprint that Graham Bonner had set out for himself? Well, most definitely. Yeah. Um, a, a lot happens in a short amount of time in, in NHL careers. Um, but sure, of course, I mean, dreams of uh, ho hoisting the Stanley Cup, I mean, you know, putting on, you know, an NHL sweater at the draft and here you are in training camp amongst all, all your heroes. I mean, you don't have to be a Montreal Canadian fan to know that you're walking to Montreal Canadian royalty. Um, but it seemed like, yes, this is the next step. I mean, it was from Bantam to Junior B to Junior A to, you know, World Junior train, tra uh, Training Camps. Okay, the NHL, here, here's the step. Here you are. Here's your opportunity. Where did it, where did it slip away from you? I had a career-ending injury. Um, I blew out my ankle really bad. Um, my last year in junior, I hurt it a little bit, and I played through it near the end, um, end of my last year. Um, and it seemed to be okay. I fought back. I mean, I, and I went to training camp um, the one year, and I broke my wrist, separated my collarbone uh, in an exhibition game against the U.S. Olympic team, came back, um, played in eight exhibition games that year. And I thought, okay, th this isn't my year, but I gained a whole lot of experience, and I went back to junior. But it was the following year um, where I went down to Sherbrooke for, for six games. Um, and I actually got called up that night and I played. So it would have been, we were in Halifax. So I got the call. I'd be flying back to Montreal the next day. I blew up my ankle that night and it never, never healed. It was just like, just like that. You called it a career ending injury, but yeah. I think it was only an NHL career, perhaps, ending injury because you didn't you didn't give up the game. You were relentless. You were determined, and you ended up being a journeyman through a, a bunch of minor pro leagues for a lot of years. Still, why didn't you why didn't you walk away? Well, you always have that. I mean, since you've been four or five years old, you dreamed of of playing in the NHL. I mean, there was always that thought that maybe this ankle is going to get better. You know. Um, not maybe ready for the real world, not maybe to accept that it's over. Um, I got myself into really good shape, got my ankle back and spent some time with the Olympic team and things were starting to pick up again. But the ankle was just never the same. And, you know, it's kind of like an old rock star going on tour in the 70s. I mean, you, you don't want to give it up because you love the game so much. However, in the end, it broke my heart because I was playing in leagues um, and, and they're good hockey leagues, but I wasn't anywhere near where I should have been uh, as far as my own talent and capabilities. And I was skating on one leg. I'm, I mean, I'm, I'm very, very lucky that I didn't get hurt because for those years, um, speed was a huge part of my game. People talk about, um, my shot and stuff like that. But, um, if you can't skate, you, you can't play, you can't play the game, but, um, but it steals your spirit, Mike. Yeah. How did you manage, Graham? You're playing on one leg. You're you're 
doing everything you can to stay in the game. How did you continue? Well, I think that that was the starting of my own addiction to alcohol and, and painkillers to, to deal with things off the ice. Um, I was in constant pain all the time. My ankle would explode. I'm, I'm a friend of mine who ended up coaching me in, uh, in roller hockey, Danny Cameron, came in the dressing room and he, did, he just shook his head because I used to have two huge ice packs in my ankles after the game. He says, I don't even, I don't even know how you can walk, never mind play. Um, but I mean, it's like anything. You start taking a couple just to take away the pain and, and very, very, very quickly um, you become dependent on them. Um, and, and as I was saying earlier, it, it takes, uh, my soul was broken, you know, the love that I had for the game all of a sudden was gone. Um, and I used that to, to feed my addiction. Yeah. Is there a point where you felt you reached rock bottom? I mean, at what point can you make that turn? How did you do that? Well, I knew for years that I was in trouble. But anyone who goes through um, addiction, one of the biggest things and toughest things is, I'll just <laughs> speak for myself, was I thought I let my family down, my friends down. Um, most importantly, I let myself down. Um, now what am I going to do? You know, I was supposed to play in the NHL for a long, long time, and all of a sudden the carpet's pulled out from me. It'd be like being a lawyer or a doctor, and all of a sudden, not that I'm comparing a hockey player to a lawyer or a doctor, but it's the same thing. All of a sudden you can't practice law or you can't practice helping people. Um, it, it broke my soul, and I wanted help, but I didn't know how to ask for help. Um, I wanted to die but I wanted to stay alive. It's an internal battle that you have with inside. So it becomes a pride thing and it, it carries around a lot of shame. Um, so slowly you start to slip down and before you know it, it's just like, hey, um, I wanna be alive again. And um, you know, getting clean was the hardest thing I ever did and it's enabled me to be the person I am today, but um, and I'm very proud of it. I, I know who I am today, but there were some tough days. How did you get clean? Was there a moment that you can look to? Was there a person that helped get you there? How do you do it? Well, I mean, I had some good people around me that, um, you know, knew what I was doing. I mean, obviously you're hanging out with people you shouldn't be hanging out with. I mean, I, I was a man that could play, you know, a chameleon that could wear very many hats. I could hang out with this crowd and be okay. Hang out in this crowd and hang out in this crowd because I've always been well liked, you know, and I could put on a different coat for being being in different crowds. But the people who were close to me knew is say, hey Bones, you know, you know what's going on, right? But the thing is when you're in active addiction, you lie. And the more you lie, you lie about the lies that, that you're lying about. It, it's a full-time job because you can't remember who you're lying to over here to get your story, your story straight here. <laughs> Um, so, you know, it's, uh, so I often, you know, tell my clients that, you know, it's a lot easier staying sober guys. I mean, because you don't have to remember what you said to this person. You, you just be honest. So, um, my mom saved my life. My mom was, was someone who stuck with me without my mother. I, I don't know if I would be here today. Um, I got involved with NA, AACA and, and, uh, and I went to treatment I was in treatment 123 days. And I had some stuff I had to work out. I had to figure out who Graham Bonner was, not just Graham Bonner, the hockey player. Um, and that's a journey that, uh, that I'm on every single day that I get up. And that's one of the things I encourage with my clients. It's just, um, most of us identify ourselves as being a lawyer, a doctor, a ditch digger, a janitor. That's not who you are. That's what you do for a living. So that's where my journey began. And it gave me the opportunity to, to find out who I am. Hey, I mean, today, um, I'm a grandfather, I'm a father, I'm, I'm a good son. Um, I, th I think I'm a pretty good boyfriend. Um, my goal in the mornings is, is to be kind and gentle and be the best person that I can be. And that's something I'm proud of. So hopefully, I answered that long. was that a long-winded question? <laughs> 
Listen, no, you know what? It's uh, it's more than I could have hoped for because it. Listen, we we talk all the time, and you're dealing with people in your life today. I say we talk in my role as a talk show host. We've been talking about the opioid crisis for a number of years now. I've spoken to families, Graham, who lost children in the same ways that you kind of got started. There might have been a a surgery, there was an injury. It starts with a painkiller, and next thing you know, so your story of recovery becomes all the more important and to hear how you did it and, and who was there like mom is incredibly valuable does does graham bonner today recognize graham bonner of 20 years ago have you come to terms with that version of yourself if i can put it that way oh, of course you know that's in order to get where i am you have to deal with the shame of the past because if if you don't if you don't work out your shame and your traumas you're going to carry that around um, I'm okay with what happened back then. That was part of my journey. It's enabled me to be the person that I am today. And I believe in everything happens for a reason. I mean, I count my blessings that I'm here today because I'm lucky to be here today. Um, hockey was a part of my life. My lived experience was a part of my life. And it's en enabled me to get up and go to work and help people that someone passed me a gift many years ago. And here I am today being able to, to be there for somebody. Um, especially in this, these crazy COVID days, because it's, um, it, it's thrown another, it's put a stick in the wheel sort of thing. It, it's just added more to, I mean, you talk about the opiate crisis. Um, people die every day from our disease. Um, you, you know, we get the really, really nice stories, you know, you know, I'll bump into somebody. I'll be, in, I was in Niagara Falls and I bump into someone with their family and they, and, invite their children over and say remember when daddy had to go to this special school this was his teacher this is that nice man Graham or um, somebody phones up and, and says you know I've got my five years uh, thank you very much you're a big part of my life but we also get the phone calls from the mothers the partners the daughters that say we would like to thank you for giving us our father or son back for five months but he passed away um, so we get those stories every single week, but the nuggets that you hold on to or when the people come back and you see what the gift of recovery um, does to people, um, there's not a job in the world that gives you that. How many years now for you clean? Two, four, uh, actually, <laughs> which used to be my favorite. <laughs> oh, that is, that is poetic, my friend. That is poetic. <laughs> As is, uh, like I said at the beginning, that you now do the work that you do, and you've referenced it a couple of times along the path, too. I think it's a little over a decade ago now, the uh, Canadian Association of Mental Health awarded you the Transforming Lives Award. Uh, you'd have to think almost at that point, in 08, I believe that award was granted you. Uh, you, you, you almost have to think at that point you're full circle already. What did, that, what did receiving that award mean to you? Um, when I first received it, I was a little embarrassed, um, but it grew on me a little bit and it, it, it was truly an honor. I have to, um, I have to be honest with you because it was in early recovery, you want to keep away from the accolades and trophies because that's kind of something of your past. But the way I got to it was here I am accepting a different part of my journey. Um, this is who I want to be today. Um, it's, uh, it's something that I hold very, very close to my heart. Yeah. Very How, cool. It is. It, it very much is. How close to your heart still, Graham, is hockey? Hockey? Um, I love minor midget hockey. I love the OHL. Um, we're actually hoping that the Sioux was going to host the Memorial Cup this year, uh, but we're going to see what's happening in this crazy COVID world. Um, I love the Olympics. I do struggle with the NHL a little bit. Um, I mean, I still admire the Crosbys and the McDavid's. Um, it, it's, it, it's a different game. Um, I admire their talent. I think they're fast. I, I think they're strong. At, um, it's just, I find it a bit boring, like, like I'll, I'll, I'll be honest with you. 
I appreciate the purity of the game. I'll go out and watch the kids play, and that's why I really like. Well, they, I don't think they're calling it minor midget anymore. So I, I, officially, I'm politically incorrect. So I, I apologize for that. The 15 year olds, because um, that's just that's just changed. That's where, if I'm going to go out and watch hockey and enjoy it, that's where I'm going to go. Or I'm going to head over to Kitchener and watch when the Greyhounds come to town and I go over to the Schnitzel House, the Metro Schnitzel Place, because the Odd is one of my favorite arenas um, besides the old Sioux Garden. So that's a close, close second. Um, so it's, it's funny you said that. If I want to go out, out on a Friday night, I'm going to Kitchener to watch a junior hockey game. If I can't fly to the Sioux to see the Greyhounds play. <laughs> <laughs> And great yeah, choice. That's a tr and that's the true story. Yeah, that's I'm, fantastic. Great choice on the schnitzel house, too. They don't get much better in this town than the metro when it comes to schnitzel. I take my friends there. So we'll go up on a Friday night. And, I mean, most of my friends are junior hockey friends. But the ones that aren't, I said, okay, they want to go to a game. And they say, well, we'll go up to uh, – they want to go to Mississauga to watch a junior game. And, you know, and bless, you know, bless the Steelheads. I said, no, no. I said, we're going to head over to Kitchener or Guelph to watch a game because that's, that's what junior hockey is all about. And I really love what they did to the odd. Um, they kept the old, brought in some new. Um, and to me, that's nostalgic. And that's some of the things that I really, truly love about the game. So, so for all those years, they called me those nasty names and, and called things. I've got nothing but love, but there's a funny picture I'll send to you with, with Tex the mascot from two years ago at the odd. I told you about it the other day. I'll, 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 I'll message it to it. Oh, uh, yes. I seem to recall uh, he, he posed for the picture with you, and you made sure that um, you weren't was, waving with all five fingers. He was number one. I'll just leave it at that. <laughs> You know, Graham, you got me thinking a little bit when you mentioned the Metro and Schnitzel and Kitchener. Uh, forgive me for not knowing how long the restaurant's been there, but Muyo's now caters the media room in Sault Ste. Marie, and it's one of the highlights of the trip. I love going up there. The folks are fantastic, but there's some good Italian eating up in the Sioux, too. Yeah, no, the, the food's second to none in the Sioux. Yeah, <laughs> Emil's... Um... All my friends that are scouts now, or some of my friends that are reporters, when they go to the Sioux, that's what they talk about. It's the press room, the media room. What's going on? Is it, is it homemade this? Is, is it that? The, the Sioux, to me, um, obviously, it's a very special place. My grandkids are up there. I got twins that just turned two. Um, and my daughter's up there, so it's a second home for me. But uh, no, you're not going to get uh, much better f uh, food or pizza. You know, franchises don't exist too long up there because how can you? How can you compete with, with, with uh, the food up there? So, yeah. when, you, when you look back now, all these years later, uh, do you have a, you know, nostalgic romanticism with the travel? I, can, I, I think of it. For Kitchener, we make the trip up there twice. It's the longest trip that we make. We, of course, put it in with other cities, blah, blah, blah. But for you guys, you're 30 times, 30 plus times a year, you're leaving the suit to go somewhere else, and the, the closest place is hours away. What was that like? Um, it brought us closer as the team. And we were known as, as road warriors. We took pride in that. I mean, our closest trip was Sudbury. And, um, and then North Bay, which was five and a half. And then, of course, when we did the other swing, we'd come across through northern Michigan and go into Windsor. Sarnia didn't have a team back then, so we'd come and do the, the swing. We'd play – back then, you'd play three and two and a half days. I, I don't think they can do three and three nights now. So we'd come in and play Windsor Thursday, London Friday, Kitchener for a TV game Saturday afternoon. So three games in two and a half days. Um, but it brought us together. We were, we were on the bus a lot. Um, we knew each other. Um, I, th I think the bus trips were, were very, very special. Now, we had some scary ones, you know, buses breaking down in, in the middle of nowhere. Um, but um, it's only fitting that the Sioux Greyhounds should be traveling eight hours <laughs> to go to games. It's a Greyhound <laughs> bus, <laughs> right? So. <laughs> All kidding aside. Graham, I like to finish these things up with something I call the fast five. So I'll just throw some random stuff at you and whatever comes to your brain, let me know, okay? Gotcha. How do you take your coffee? What's the best way to drink it? Black. Black. I do the same thing. Ameri I Amer take... Americano black. 
I swear it is. We should, we're going to have coffee together sometime because that is my jam right there for sure. Okay. <laughs> All right. If you could be the lead singer of any rock band, who are you going to be? Okay. I got to have a 1A and a 1B. It's going to be Black, Sa Black Sabbath and Leonard Skinner. Nice. Yep. But different, yes. like very different. Sabbath yes, is but, pretty heavy and, and you got some country twang to Skinner. Yeah, but it's about the lyrics and the feel. Black Sabbath are, are, are my Beatles. Um, Geezer Butler is writing. Ozzy didn't do much of the writing. It was Geezer Butler. Their, their music is timeless. And to me, there's nothing better than sitting down and just listening to Ronnie Van Zandt, The Simple Man Sing. Fantastic. I love it. Uh, you mentioned pizza franchises that don't last long up in the Sioux, because how could they? Does pineapple belong on pizza, though, Graham? Ah, flip a coin. <laughs> Depends on the mood you're in? Yeah, I, I'm neither nor on that one. I've liked it, haven't liked it. I'm not a hater of anything on a pizza. Just bring it. What are you binging right now? Sons of Anarchy. Oh, nice. Yeah, I've uh, I watched it years ago. But, uh, my partner, Kim, and I are, are back into it. So, yeah. Oh, so it's a second time around. Yeah, I watch it. I haven't gone back to it, but. Yeah, yeah, I've gone. Uh, we're in season season five. It's starting to heat up. Not that yeah. it ever slows down. That's true. That's true. Do you ride? No, 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 no. no. I think uh, I'm going to keep my body the way it is. <laughs> All right, last one for you. You can fill in the blank. COVID-19 is blank. Fill it in with whatever you want. It's real. It's real. Um, but I'd like to add something to it. I, I truly believe we're going to come out as better people at the end of this. We're struggling with this. This is our world war. Um, but I truly believe in to it for Graham to stay in a healthy place at the end of this, whatever it may be through all the heartache that we're going to be a better place for it. Uh, I'm happy to hear the place that you're in because obviously it's a better place than you were in 25 years ago, two, four now clean. Like you said, it's a, it's a well of a story, Graham, and we really appreciate you making the time to share it with us today. Thank you. My, it's been my honor and a shout out to all the Kitchener Ranger fans. Um, nothing but love so the next time I'm walking around the arena nobody knows who I am there anyways but it'll be a flashback from the 80s great place thank you very much I was honored Mike